The Hog Blog is brought to you by Rodent Pro. Open 24 hours a day at rodentpro.com. And Vision Products, the best rack at the best price. Check them out at visionproducts.us. Hello and welcome to Hog Blog Genetics Video 3. I am your host, Dan Kroll, and I'm so glad you've tuned in for another exciting installment of basic genetics. In our last video, we stopped out uh, talking about um, basic or simple Mendelian genetics. And before we get started today, I just wanted to give you a little history lesson uh, about who that guy actually was. Now, when I say Mendelian genetics, I'm actually referring to a monk named Gregor Mendel who did something that no other human up to that point had ever done. He discovered the basics of how inheritance works using pea plants as his subject. And as I mentioned before, because the genetics of plants works exactly the same way as the genetics of humans in most cases, uh, it, it applies to everybody. So prior to Mendel, there were lots of theories, some of which you would probably laugh very heartily at. Um, for, to explain how uh, inheritance actually works, but it wasn't until this guy came along all those years ago in Austria with his little garden and his very, very good data collection techniques that we actually came up with a, an explanation for how inheritance works. Also, as a side note, Mendel's work was the catalyst, which combined with Darwin's work on evolution created a unifying theory of evolution. You cannot overestimate how important the work of Gregor Mendel, Charles Darwin, and then later biologists like Haldane, Fisher, and Wright, uh, who put all their work together during the modern synthesis, um, and basically came up with a unifying theory of evolution, and what is now the unifying theory of all the natural sciences. So this is really important stuff, and it's also really useful for snake breeding. Now, I just did a bunch of name dropping, so I'll just add one more. Reginald Punnett. In 1905, he published a book that is thought to be the first book that brought the subject of genetics to the public, and it was called, appropriately, uh, Mendelism. In, in it, he introduced a tool which could be used to predict the probability of outcomes of various breedings. Now, it is still used 110 years later by students, scientists, and snake breeders alike, and that, of course, is the Punnett square. So all a Punnett square does is provide a mathematical model for predicting the probable outcomes of any given breeding or cross, as we call it. It's important that we understand the difference right now so that we can avoid confusion and, and frankly, really childish arguments on the internet in the future. So, so the Punnett square will not tell you what your actual babies are going to look like. It will give you a predictive mathematical model for predicting the probability of what your babies are likely to look like, okay? So let me just give you a really simple example to accentuate that. Let's say you have a lady who is pregnant, okay, a human. Uh, so assuming she's having one baby, uh, that baby has an equal chance of either being male or female because in humans there's two gender options, okay? That means that there is a 50% chance that the baby will be a male and a 50% chance that the baby will be a female. Now in this case, the mathematical probability provides no predictive ability because it's an equal chance, 50-50, that the baby will be one or the other, okay? So it's like a flip of the coin. Will it be male or will it be a female? But what probability can tell us is what the likelihood of other um, interactions. So let's say that same woman has five children in a row. What the Punnett square can do and what probability can do is predict what the chances are of every single one of those babies being one gender or three of those babies being male and two being female. So for example, the chances of a woman having five babies in a row all the same gender are actually only 3.125%. Uh, it's extremely low probability that any given woman is going to have five boys or five girls. But it does happen, right? So the Punnett square doesn't say you will not have five boys and five girls. It says it's mathematically unlikely. Now the reason why it does happen is the thing that we really have to grasp, which is every single baby has nothing to do with the baby that comes before it or the baby that comes after it. Every single baby has a 50-50 chance of being male or female. So even if you have three babies before that are all girls, you still have a 50-50 chance of the next baby being a girl, okay? So um, when the sample size is larger, these predictive models are very useful. But when you're talking about just five flips of a coin, for example, uh, the chances of you getting five in a row mathematically seem low, but it does happen, okay? Does that make sense? Now that we're done talking about the things the Punnett square can't do for us, let's talk about some of the things it can do for us, and let's make a Punnett square. A basic Punnett square is used to predict the outcomes of one gene and its alleles, 
and it's a grid with four squares. So along the top, we're going to place the possible alleles that mom can create, and on the side, we'll place the possible alleles that dad can create. And then in the middle, we'll combine them in, in a very simple and intuitive way by sort of multiplying them together. Now keep in mind, the outer sides of the square represent what? They represent meiosis, right? So during meiosis, the, uh, the genome of the mom and dad are split into halves. And so um, one sperm might get a copy of one gene and another sperm might get a copy of another one, right? And then the squares in the middle here represent what? Fertilization, right? So if, you're, <laughs> if you've been paying attention in the other videos, then you know fertilization. So, <clears throat> so here we have haploid sperm. We call it haploid when they have one copy of the uh, one set of, of chromosomes. And then here we have haploid eggs, which have one copy of chromosomes. And then right here we have diploid or fertilized embryos, right? So they have two copies and they're unique little individuals. So if mom is an albino, um, we'll put little a and little a, and dad is an albino, we'll have a little a and a little a. That means that your Punnett square is not only very simple, but it's actually completely useless because um, you know, if, if you have albino, all albino alleles, the babies can only get albino alleles, right? So you'll have all albino babies. But let's make it a little bit more interesting. So let's say mom is a heterozygous and, uh, for albino and dad is heterozygous for albino. That means that when mom makes an egg, it's either going to have a normal gene, big A, or an albino gene, little a, okay? So we'll put the albino gene here, the normal gene here, and then the dad is the same way. Any given sperm is either gonna be an albino sperm or a normal sperm. And then when we combine those together, we get here we get a big A, big A, and then we get a uh, big A, little A, and then we get a big A, little A, and then we get a little A, little A, okay? So <clears throat> now you might be saying, well, there's not going to be just four babies, right? We're going to have more than four babies when we have a pair of snakes breeding. Well, yeah, that's true with snakes, but with humans, you might only have one baby. So the Punnett square is still useful because what it is doing is it's giving you uh, a mathematical representation of the percent likelihood of any given baby being one of these things. And what I mean by that is, here we have four squares, which represent the four possible outcomes. 25% um, of those babies uh, in this square are albino, right? So that means that any given baby has a 25% chance of being an albino, okay? So just like the mom had a 50-50 chance of having a boy or a girl, in this particular breeding, her chances of having an albino offspring are 25% every single time. It's not exactly a flip of a coin, so it's less likely, right? And now two of these babies, you know, so two out of four, which is what? 50%, right? So 50% chance of them being heterozygous, just like mom and dad, right? And then there's one of the babies that has two normal genes. So that's one out of four, that's 25%. So there's a 25% chance that the baby is going to be a normal carrying no albino genes, okay? So that's how the Punnett square works. It gives you a, a mathematical percentage, and that is it. It's that simple. So this is where the importance of sample size really comes into play. So if, if you have an animal that has one baby like a human, these percentages will represent the percent chance that that baby will be any one of these given things. Now, is it possible? Now, is it possible for a human having one baby to have one of these unusual alleles? Of course, it's possible, but the chances are much lower uh, than they would be for it to be one of the uh, more common alleles, okay? So, so when we look at these numbers here, for snakes, for example, snakes have uh, lots of babies. So if you have a corn snake, for example, that has 20 babies, uh, you increase the chances that every single one of those alleles is going to be expressed in any given clutch of eggs. So what you can do is instead of taking it as a percent chance that any baby is, you can see it as what percentage of your overall clutch is going to be represented by it. So, so for example, if you have um, uh, 16 eggs in a clutch and 25% chance that any one of them is going to be an albino and a 25% chance that any of them is going to be a normal head for nothing and a 50% chance that any any one of them is going to be a, um, a normal head for albino, then when, you, when you're sitting down and you're trying to predict what's going to pop out, you can probably guess that about four albino babies and uh, 12 normal babies are going to come out of that clutch. Now, does it always happen that way? No. I, I've bred head to head and gotten almost all albinos, and I've bred head to head and gotten no albinos because reality versus uh, probability is not exactly the same thing. So that is the basics of how 
uh, a Punnett square works and how you can use it for you. Now I know that I just gave you a little bit of a taste there, but in the next video, all we're going to do the whole time is do Punnett squares and, uh, and learn how those percentages work and what exactly they mean. So definitely tune in for hog blog video four, where we're going to get deep and get dirty with the, with the Punnett square. And we're also going to talk about some of the other modes of inheritance, which throw off those Punnett square numbers. Okay. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hognoseblog at gmail.com or comment right here underneath the video and make sure you subscribe. I'm Dan Kroll and thanks for watching the hog blog.